cold sale water provider in Southeast United States. His group is responsible for technical analysis and modeling of projects ranging between 200 million to 400 million. He's a registered professional engineer with the state of Florida, a diplomat of the American Academy of Water Resource Engineers and fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers. He currently chairs Florida Water and Climate Alliance. And with that, I will pass it on to Dr. Russo to introduce, uh, to give us a quick overview of the webinar today and then introduce the next speaker. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Samson. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, as I said, we have excellent uh, panelists lined up for you. Um, just a big picture, what we are trying to achieve here is uh, to frame some important issues. In this case, we'll be talking more uh, with the water energy food nexus um, and a little bit of the water sharing issue as well, also because there is implication to that. Um, so what we will have is a five to 10 minute frame setting presentation by the expert that we will hear uh, now after I introduced, uh, and then we will provide a, a sufficient time for audience uh, interactions through question and answer. We believe that uh, this kind of form where people ask probably is more effective and targeted. So that's why we, would, we wanted to leave uh, quite a bit of time for uh, question and answer. With that, I'm gonna go to my uh, first presenter. This Professor meeting Del is being recorded. Professor Dale Whittington from University of North Carolina. Uh, professor Whittington is uh, a professor of uh, environmental science and engineering, uh, city and regional planning and public policy at the University of North Carolina Chapel here. Uh, since 1986, he has worked for uh, World Bank and other international agencies on development and application of technique uh, for estimating the economic value of environmental resources in developing countries. Um, he has been working with so many countries that I can <laughs> count, um, including Haiti, Guatemala, Mexico, Nigeria, Ghana, Libya, Liberia, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Tanzania, Pakistan, Nepal, still go, it will go. Uh, I'm really happy to have him. He has uh, a lot of knowledge on that uh, area. Um, and that's the floor is to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me just share my screen here. Um, I don't have a, a long presentation this morning. I mean, this is going to be mostly a uh, discussion, um, but I, I do want to make uh, three points just to begin our discussion uh, today. Um, I want to say just a bit about the filling of the GERD, and, and then I want to talk about um, the economics of the uh, GERD on Egypt a bit, and then I want to say a few things about the uh, role of the international community and uh, the negotiations over the GERD. Um, I, I do want to, before I begin, I, I just want to refer you to an excellent presentation that uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Wheeler made uh, this week um, at the UCLA uh, webinar series. Um, and um, uh, you can uh, use this link to uh, get to the uh, uh, Kevin's presentation. If you haven't, if you haven't seen it, we'll, we'll put that in the chat. So I'm not going to repeat, you know, what what Kevin did at the UCLA um, uh, thing, but I I, I do want to um, make a couple points about the the filling of the guard because I think you know there has been some confusion in the press on this. It, um, there's a high probability that the the guard can be uh, filled without causing significant harm. Uh, to uh, Egypt, um, uh, Kevin and others made this um, uh, analysis in uh, the article on the left uh, in Nature um, last year. Um, and it's very likely that Egypt will be able to continue to release 55.5 uh, BCM from the Aswan High Dam while the GERD is being filled and will not experience any uh, water deficits. The, you know, the GERD is a hydropower facility. It, it's not consumptive use. And importantly, um, uh, Kevin made the point that right now the S1 high dam uh, is full, high dam reservoir is full. 
Um, so what's most likely to happen is that as the GERD gets filled, the S1 high dam will be drawn down and then it will recover again uh, without uh, Egypt uh, experiencing any uh, water shortfalls. Um, but there is a small probability that Egypt will experience um, uh, some deficits during uh, filling. Uh, this would occur during a multi-year drought um, while Ethiopia attempts to fill the GERD. The bottom line here from the negotiation point of view is I think that from at least from a technical point of view, it should be relatively easy uh, for the repairings to reach an agreement on filling. Um, and so there's, I think, you know, there, among the technical community, there's, there's really a growing consensus, um, particularly among the hydrologists and the, the water resource engineers about the key issues in the basin that the, the GERD uh, poses. Um, my second point is this is not true about the economic impacts of the GERD. Um, there is a, a lot of misunderstanding about how uh, the GERD uh, will affect um, the economies of Ethiopia, Sudan, um, in, and uh, Egypt. Um, uh, there, there are two recent papers um, uh, that have been published. Um, the one on the right um, is a recent uh, two, 2021 paper on Egypt's water deficit uh, published in environmental research letters. The one on the left has been published in the journal Water uh, just in 2022. Um, uh, both of these papers uh, say that there are going to be very large economic losses in Egypt um, uh, due uh, to the GERD. Um, I think if there are any, you know, Egyptians watching today, I, I would just say that both of these papers are wrong. Um, uh, and it, it's surprising um, in some sense that uh, they were published in serious uh, scientific journals. Um, I, I do think uh, uh, it's really important to follow the uh, social media in the repairing countries to understand how this kind of information spreads. Um, and I think it you know, complicates the negotiations. Um, uh, Kevin and I with others are, uh, are writing rebuttals to these papers, um, but uh, uh, we can talk about the papers uh, if you want, but um, uh, if, you, if you just step back for a minute and you think, well, what would I need to do as a technical person to understand the economic impacts of the GERD on the economies of the riparian countries, I would need a good water resources model, a good river basin model, and I need a good model of the economy. And neither of these papers have either one of these things. If you go back to this slide here, um, on the right, um, uh, Mohammed Bashir and uh, working at the University of Manchester with Julian Haru's team, uh, shows how you can do this with a you know very fine model of the river basin and uh, linking that model to um, the model of the Egyptian economy. So there there, there is a, a large literature on uh, the economic impacts of um, the GERD and the Aswan High Dam on the economies of the riparians, but they are um, they're they're not really cited in these uh, two recent papers. So um, my, my third uh, message um, is about the uh, role of the international community in uh, the negotiations. Um, from my perspective, I, I don't see much point, honestly, in resuming negotiations unless the riparians want an agreement. I, I have no knowledge, of course, personally, whether the, the three, repair, three main riparians want to reach an agreement at this stage but I don't think there's much to be gained from the international community trying to pressure the riparians. Um, if they're convinced they're better off now without an agreement. I, I do think that um, there's a need for a concrete uh, draft agreement that uh, represents a, you know, a, a reasonable compromise between the positions of the parties. And I, I'm talking here about an actual text of the agreement. I mean, it, it, uh, uh, it can be the basis for serious negotiations. And, but there is one thing I think the, the international um, uh, community could do uh, at this point to fa uh, facilitate um, um, an agreement. And, and that's an insurance agree uh, um, 
a deal that would help Egypt deal with economic losses that would occur if there was a prolonged drought during the filling of the GERD. There is a small risk, um, uh, and it's reasonable uh, to uh, for Egypt to want to protect itself against this possibility of a shortfalls during uh, the filling of the GERD or during a, after that during a prolonged drought. And I think the international community could uh, play a key role in making uh, such an insurance deal happen. So let me stop here and um, just some things to get some ideas to get us started in the discussion. And I look forward to questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gale. Uh, before we go to the next speaker, I just want to make a couple of public announcements. This webinar session is being recorded. Uh, if you have any questions, please submit your questions in the Q&A. Uh, I saw a couple of people raised their hands. We will not be taking voice questions uh, due to the large number of attendees. So we encourage you to submit your questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Okay, and uh, we will uh, uh, wait for the end to, to get to the question and, and answer session. Like I said at the beginning, those of you who might miss the beginning, we are giving quite a bit of time for audience interaction. Please, and that's the whole idea, send your question and then we will have those discussions. So going to the next uh, presenter, um, that will be Dr. Edo Abraham. Um, his research interests are mainly in application of numerical optimization, control and system theory to advance weather management and environmental engineering applications. Some of his research deal with optimization of multipurpose reservoir. Uh, he has done quite a bit in terms of uh, water energy for Nexus as well. Um, the, the floor is yours and thank you for, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Edo, you are, you are. Yes. Me. Can you see my screen? Is it? Uh, yes. Full of screen? yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks, uh, Russo. Um, so um, what, what I would like to uh, do today perhaps is um, uh, kind of frame a little bit about how uh, operational planning of uh, water energy food infrastructure um, is done in a transboundary basin. Uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit about both long-term planning and then operational management. And I will show some results uh, from this paper, which is uh, 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 done with my research uh, assistant. And, 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 and uh, it, it shows some possibilities for cooperation and, and kind of the potential economic benefits for all riparian countries and, and under what conditions and, and so on. So I, I may skip through some, some things, but I hope later on we'll come to it in Q&A. So maybe I start with this idea that um, um, uh, kind of uh, with a statement that we now have, I would say, multiple tools uh, for uh, integrated planning of uh, water and energy and agricultural infrastructure, uh, irrigation infrastructure uh, in, in this wave next uh, nexus context. Um, and also we have, uh, let's say, operational tools uh, that are really detailed uh, that could kind of pull together these, these uh, infrastructures and, and simulate them um, to kind of find optimal allocation of water and, and, and optimal uh, uh, use of these, these resources. Um, so typically um, we have, uh, you know, we, we, can, we, we now can build uh, really detailed gridded uh, uh, models of, of the existing infrastructure, electricity grid. We can simulate these under different climate conditions, you know, look at deficits. Uh, and, and so this is one of the things we do. Huh? So optimizing these operations themselves. So I will come to this. And then of course, in, in long-term infrastructure planning, we would like to know, for example, where we would want to develop in Ethiopia, as an example, uh, solar, wind, and hydropower, even outside the, the Nile Basin, and cost optimally, and perhaps analyzing these, these kind of uh, trade-offs in, in water use within the different sectors, uh, within different users, regions, and, and, and this kind of analysis. So we, we really have these tools. So that's that's one, one concept or one point. Um, 
And then when it comes to uh, cooperation in a transboundary basin, of course, we, we also have already some literature. Uh, uh, I think uh, Dale, uh, Professor Whittington already talked a little bit about this, uh, showed some, some uh, literature on the GERD. Uh, but I, I would like to also point out uh, things uh, around cooperative game theory, for example, that look at uh, specifically for the Nile Basin, this work by Dinar and, and Nigatu looks at uh, water sharing different under different water sharing agreements, uh, whether water trade uh, could be used as a way of cooperation and, and also internalizing some kind of uh, externalities like sediment management in a network of reservoirs uh, and then uh, kind of allocating uh, the, the water use optimally within the basin and then uh, paying for extra water used uh, besides the kind of the, the, the agreed uh, share. And what they show is that the additional kind of gains for these countries are actually uh, small. And sort of the implication is that we, we ought to look for other ways of kind of enlarging this envelope for, for cooperation, I would call it. And, and uh, in, in, in our work, what we look at is actually uh, we have within Africa, even recently, uh, free trade agreements have become operational. So we could look at free trade uh, in, in agricultural products and mm -hmm. in, in, in energy production. So, so as I showed earlier, if we're looking at long term infrastructure planning as well, we should also look at these, these cooperative modes in the planning itself. So this is what we, we I look at. So enlarging this, this core where it's actually uh, uh, beneficial for all parties and therefore perhaps uh, there will be more uh, ideas, uh, more possibilities for cooperation. Um, in doing this, you know, you would be looking at, because you have the spatial variation within the basin and, and, and agricultural suitability, of course, hydro, hydropower uh, possibilities or possibilities for solar and, and, and wind power as well. So, so this kind of increased specialization in energy and food production could, could be looked at, modeled uh, in planning and operations. Uh, and you could also have uh, things like regional self-sufficiency, which, which have, of course, uh, kind of security values. Uh, uh, and those could also be incorporated in such models. So th this is something we look at. What does the model look like in general? You could, you could have really, uh, like I said, detailed uh, gridded uh, models of the, the, the actual water grid, uh, agricultural uh, lands, uh, both uh, rain fed and, 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 um, and, and irrigated agriculture. And we could look at uh, optimizing the cropping patterns within the basin, uh, regional integration of energy networks or uh, specifically you know, electricity networks, uh, free trade zones, as I mentioned, and, and so then describing all these and, and solving uh, these uh, social planning pro optimization problems, where should we grow what, where should we produce uh, electricity, when, and so on. So we, we, we build these, these kinds of models. Um, we could also look at, uh, we, we do also look at different levels of cooperation in managing these infrastructures. So and, uh, one, one way is that uh, we look at the unilateral scenario. So each country uh, optimizes its economic benefits from uh, hydropower production, from irrigation, and so on. And uh, of course, trades with, within, within the region, uh, in international markets, uh, all the way to uh, uh, where we, we, we actually optimize for the whole region uh, with constraints that in this uh, regional scenario, actually each country does better than its unilateral case. Huh? So we, we can actually solve these kinds of uh, mathematical problems. Um, what we show in this work is that uh, looking at historic scenarios with historic infrastructure, uh, deterministic historic simulations, we show that uh, cooperation scenarios result in uh, uh, significant uh, gains for each country, uh, most of it for Egypt, because uh, we also model the efficiency of uh, uh, production processes. And it turns out in Ethiopia and in, in Sudan, uh, uh, water productivity is quite low. Uh, so um, it's kind of the distribution uh, here is, is not, um, it, it's not balanced, let's say. Um, uh, and we also show that, uh, for example, just even by, by, by sharing information, that is flow, expected flow downstream, already uh, for each country, uh, compared to the unilateral case, uh, you get a, a lot of gains. Um, 
Uh, and you could also, in, in this kind of work, what we could do is we could tease out where the, the kind of the efficiencies are comparing agricultural uh, water productivity, spatially, explicitly uh, within the countries. Um, uh, of course, we can also analyze things like what in the food basket, what, what, what does it look like? How are these countries specializing, for example, shifting their production compared to the unilateral case, what is grown? To, uh, to the case where, where they are coordinating their production processes. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, for today's discussion, we'll, we'll probably talk about GERD as well. We, we also uh, simulate with the GERD in place and, and, and looking at irrigation expansion in Ethiopia. Even in those cases, what we find is the same thing compared to unilateral cases, uh, Ethiopia and, and Sudan and Egypt all gain significantly in, in, in billion dollars per year. Um, what we find is also that uh, Ethiopia, for example, expanding its irrigation uh, results in, in, in let's say, uh, significant uh, increases in income or benefits compared to just selling electricity through GERD. Uh, and then to, to emphasize uh, and, and go back to the water sharing concepts in, in, in cooperative game theory is that actually in our simulations, for example, with the GERD, uh, with all these significant gains uh, for Ethiopian coordination, we see only around 11% reduction in flow at, at, at Dongola. Uh, so that's actually, uh, you know, under normal, what, what you call fair allocations, that that would be way less than what Ethiopia would, would, would be allocated. Uh, so, uh, so cooperation scenarios do cushion this kind of reduction downstream. And so uh, the message for me would be, uh, yeah, we should be planning infrastructure under these conditions, assuming these conditions. And then, of course, uh, I, I leave uh, to the other experts on, on social sciences and on, on the political economy on how, 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 uh, yeah, how do you institutionally uh, make this possible. I'll stop here for now. Okay, um, just uh, also update, um, as you saw, we have four panelists, but for some reason, one of our panelists is unable to join us and I did not get a message. Uh, we will continue uh, ours. If he join us, we will, we will come back uh, to him. Uh, the next uh, uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Abdul Karim. Um, I'm really um, happy to have him. Uh, Dr. Abdul Karim is the country representative for Ethiopia and the regional representative for the International Water Management Institute. Sometimes people call it UMI. Uh, before that, he was the deputy executive director and the manager of the Basin Wide Program for the Nile Basin uh, Secretariat. Um, Dr. Said led, uh, as a specialist, led uh, probably some of you heard. Um, a very good tool, the Nile Basin Decision Support Tool, which is the first comprehensive and analytical tool, tool jointly developed by the members of the, the Nile Basin Initiative. I'm, I'm really happy to have him and uh, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Can you yes. hear me? Yes. And can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Perfect. So I have a few slides. Um, just, yeah. So thank you, Dr. Tursa, for the invitation. Thank you for organizing the forum. And um, it was really a pleasure listening to Dale uh, speaking about the GERD and then the more bigger optimization problem, especially um, by uh, Dr. Edo. Um, on the expanding the envelope of cooperation, which somehow my, my presentation also talks about. Um, I will be focusing more on the bigger issue of uh, cooperation rather than focusing on the good. So um, just to give you just a refresher, uh, I just want to give first highlights of the water resource space in the Nile Basin. I'll be focusing really on the Nile Basin. So what you see now uh, displayed is the rainfall pattern. And what is peculiar here is really is the Nile, one of the complexity of the Nile rise from the fact that really very small area of the Nile Basin gets rainfall or sufficient rainfall, let's say. And that is the, the source of water for the rest of the basin. So the vast you know, area in the north, the more the reddish or orange 
colored area in Sudan and Egypt are arid or semi-arid or desert with very little internally generated water. Upstream, although there's quite substantial amount of rainfall, uh, there's also an issue of high, highly unpred high unpredictability of the rainfall because of, you know, not only climate change, even under natural variability, uh, like for example, the Blue Nile, which has the, which provides the bulk of the stream flow to the Nile is highly variable between years and between seasons as well. So this is really a challenge. We know more than 70% of the population, especially in upstream countries, depend on rainfall uh, for agriculture, uh, but they are increasingly facing this rainfall variability, especially during the growing season. And that's one of the major drive why governments prefer irrigation. Uh, when it comes to the stream flow, um, as I've said earlier, the, the runoff is generated really in very relatively small area of the Nile. I just want to give this highlight. The annual runoff usually is given as 84, but work by NVI um, gives an estimate between 84 and 90, 91. I'm just quoting the, the number from the, the State of the Nile River Basin report issued by NVI in 2021. But also groundwater, there's also a substantial amount of groundwater in the Nile. So um, especially uh, well, what you see on the, on the right-hand side of the, uh, the slide, the picture, two pictures, one in the middle shows the transboundary aquifers. Uh, the, the other one, extreme right, shows um, the groundwater productivity map for the Eastern Nile, prepared by ENTRO, the Eastern Nile Technical Regional Office, as part of NBI. There is some potential or substantial amount of groundwater, especially in what, they, what is called the Nubian Sandstone Aquifer. Uh, but the challenge, of course, is this is not renewable. Uh, and this also very deep aquifer with huge like extraction costs. So whichever resource you see, there are challenges. Come to the surface runoff. If you really focus entirely on the, the blue water, river water, that's quite, quite small compared to the demand on it. Rainfall is highly variable, highly unpredictable. Groundwater to some extent, where you have most of the resources against the deep groundwater and then renewable, especially if we are talking about groundwater for, for agriculture. <clears throat> Sorry. Now, given this resource base, when you see the current situation in the basin, uh, especially this is a basin, especially most countries, they have sub substantially unmet demand. So basic needs, actually, what you see here in the upper left corner is the percentage of population using improved drinking water. You see most of the countries really the percentage is very low. What you see here is Egypt, um, obviously. Uh, this is again from the State of the Nile Basin report uh, by NBI from the 2021 report. And what you see in the lower side is access to electricity or electricity consumption kilowatt hour per capita per year. This is from 2020, 2010 figure. I also checked 2024, there's not much difference, very little difference. Uh, so most of the countries really have very, very low level of uh, access to electricity or electricity consumption. Uh, whereas, you know, especially in upstream water source area, there's a substantial amount of water which has not been developed yet to any, you know, uh, appreciable extent. That's why this figure from uh, the World Water Development Report 4 shows, you know, the, uh, the water scarcity by, I mean, what you call physical scarcity, where the resource is not available, and also economic scarcity, where the resource has not been developed. And this, again, we have huge population, right? Very rapid population growth. The Nile Basin, this is the number of the population size projected by 2050 to, to exceed 1 billion. Uh, this is for all Nile Basin riparian countries. And when you see from 1950, the total population in all the countries around 84 million. And now, <coughs> sorry, by around 2050, it's going to exceed about 1 billion. Then you can see you know, the pressure is really mounting on governments to do something about like meeting the demands for water, food, and, and energy of growing population. But one other point which I would like to highlight is not only the total number of people here, but also we have a huge, huge uh, use bulge in these countries and huge unemployment rates, and which could potentially lead to instability in these countries. 
So developing the water resource, not a question of only economic development, but also ra rather really as also a security and stability you know, uh, perspective as well. When you talk about climate variability, again, investment is very important because we're talking about water, food, energy nexus, and investment in the systems. This is what you see here is from um, a report by um, Hall and, and others, which is on, about coping with the curse of freshwater variability. And you, what you see here actually is the coefficient of vari variation of monthly runoff to just indicate the variability of runoff uh then again is to investment increasing investment so it's what you see here the green dots are developed nations um, or high income countries whereas the red dots here are low income countries so you see here the low income countries generally they have low level of investment although they have they also have high variability of runoff and as an example i'm showing here the seasonal you know variability of or variation of runoff of the blue night so investment in food, water, and the energy systems is really absolutely uh, essential for these countries to cope with climate variability, but also to, to meet the growing demands of their, their population. So the, the challenge for the Nile really is, um, you have you know, uh, part of the Nile, mostly downstream, with very little internally generated water, although potentially there's huge groundwater potential as well, uh, but high level of dependence of their economies on the Nile. This is one side from the, from the right-hand side here, and we're on the right-hand side, which shows the condition in most upstream countries. There's very big or rapid population growth, economic growth in many of the countries. Climate change apply, apply for, for all. There's increasing water demand, food demand, energy demand. There's a big pressure to expand infrastructure. The question now is for a transboundary water resource like the Nile, given this contrasting resource endowment and demand situation in the basin, how do you develop this kind of resource without or in a way that will be as less painful as possible for everyone and then as win-win as possible for everyone or all countries? In the history of the Nile Basin Cooperation, always there has been two perspectives, you know, unilateral uh, development pressures on governments that stage because population is increasing, uh, the food, water, energy demand are increasing. So there's a big pressure to develop the resource. On the other hand, this is a transpond, and we'll talk about the, the, the river flow, it's a transboundary resource. So there are attempts to do this through cooperation not really, especially when it comes to investment, my own view is not so successful when it comes to infrastructure investments. So there are these two perspectives or two contrasting contexts. On the, uh, the national level, there's urgency for develop, I mean, to meet the development needs. There's a demand pressure on governments, but on the other hand, when you look at the transboundary uh, perspective, of course, you, you, you want countries to work together, but at the same time, there's uh, increasing recognition that you know, infrastructure investments you do through cooperation usually take time, as you can understand. They are very much process oriented. And that could be frustrating for some countries. So that will reinforce again unilateralism. Again, that will possibly lead to some more conflict or more tense relation between countries. So to this also like, um, what also complicates uh, to a greater extent, I can say, is or the historical and legal, you know, uh, context, for example, uh, and the perceptions and you know the huge trust deficit uh, the Nile countries started with when they started their cooperation or the through the NBI in 1999. So, given these two perspectives, you know, how what is the best way forward? To, to harness the water, energy, food uh, opportunities or system opportunities the countries have in a manner that will be conducive for all countries to meet their growing water demand, at the same time um, sustain the Nile River itself because the river is also a stakeholder in this. Now, um, I have some 
towards to this. I mean, just put just more for for discussion. Uh, my understanding was like these are just like uh, issue framing or issue setting uh, presentations that we can have discussion more. Uh, in my view, um, investing in infrastructure. Is, sorry, sorry. Investing in infrastructure in food and water energy systems is absolutely important for these countries. Otherwise. Not only the, the growing demands are not fulfilled, but also the peace and the stability of the region will be at stake. So now, how do how do how, how do we do it? So due to the high seasonal interannual variability of the river flow, in my view, any meaningful utilization denial requires a storage of water. So when we talk about storage, uh, we need to invest in integrated water storage, not only dams but also groundwater reserves, soil moisture, et cetera. So meaning looking at storage from a bigger perspective, not only the gray, the gray infrastructure we normally you know, um, talk about. Then, when we, especially when it comes to dams and um, like reservoirs, there's a big um, improvement we can do in terms of you know, optimizing the use of water if countries really coordinate the operation of the dams. Especially in the last decades, hydropower was or has been the major drive for dam development in some upstream, upstream countries. But looking forward, probably um, we need to think about how harnessing other energy resources, other renewable energy sources like wind or solar or geothermal, including hydropower. Because hydropower alone, a study done by, by NBI has shown that hydropower alone is not going to meet all the energy requirements of the countries. And the other thing is, um, if you remember what I showed at the beginning, I really um, want countries to talk about how best to utilize their you know, diversified water resources, not only the river flow, what we normally call blue, blue water. So we need to exploit the full potential of rainfall agriculture uh, with supplemental irrigation, groundwater for irrigation, et cetera, all diversified source of water. When it comes to the cooperation, I, I like the idea of you know, expanding or enlarging, I think, by Edo, Dr. Edo, enlarging the envelope of cooperation. Um, I'm talking about that one here. At least the last 20 plus years through NBI, what I am you know, familiar with, the cooperation has been really very much water-centric. So people talk about um, water shares, water quotas, for example. But probably we need to think really, if we try to expand beyond the, the just sharing the pie of water or water itself uh, into more broad-based cooperation, could that help in unlocking the current impasse? I, I would like a question, probably. I feel, uh, I feel like, you know, what really matters for the the bottom line for the countries really is to meet the demands of the growing population. You know, water is critical for that. We know that. But the amount of uh, the goods and services you produce from a given quantity of water really depends upon the technology you're putting in. So for this reason, you know, water as a quantity itself, you know, although it has been driving the cooperation dialogue so far, probably we, we also need to think about how to broaden or expand the envelope as was, you know, the term is by Dr. Ibrahim Aliyev. So the last point I want to make really is, uh, especially when it comes to scientific uh, community, um, the advanced tools for analyzing complex decision problems in transboundary cooperation will, will help really. Uh, I, that will bring me back to the point number two here, which I just skipped earlier. Basically means although transboundary, um, Water management challenges, they have you know, dual nature. They are technical as well as political stroke legal. So the scientific community can help in, in showing different ways of uh, like using the, the resource or developing the resource in a manner that will really address the needs of all countries. So this kind of information would help even the dialogue. Um, and then probably the countries could embrace more and more technical solutions that would be uh, more win-win and more uh, optimized from the resource usage perspective. So I leave it there and um, thank you for your attention. Back to you, Tatruso. 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that excellent view of uh, big pictures. I really appreciate it. And we have gotten quite a bit of questions. And please, uh, folks, continue to send those and we'll come back. Um, the last but not the least is uh, Professor Yaakov. <laughs> uh, he had some challenge joining us. I'm, I'm so happy that he's able to join us uh, today. Um, uh, professor Yaakov is uh, a professor of hydro politics uh, of Northeastern Africa and the Middle East. Uh, he is a graduate of Addis Ababa University, Ohio State, and the University of Zurich. So he has the big picture of many places. He has published numerous articles, co-authored books, and contributed books chapter as well. One of his book, uh, I think from 20, 2007, about uh, uh, the night, the dilemma of national and regional hist uh, regional hydropolitics is a good one if you want to um, check it out. Uh, his main teaching and research areas are hydropolitics, water governance, uh, geopolitics, and regional sec uh, security in Northeast Africa, as well as in the Middle Eastern. He is an advisor for the Ethiopian Ministry of Water and Energy, uh, currently is also part of the negotiating team uh, on the GERD. Uh, Professor Yaakov, uh, great to have you and happy that you made it as well. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Dr. Tolosau. Uh, <clears throat> I'm pleased that uh, I, I appear on, on this uh, presentation uh, panel. I listen to all the uh, presenters. Uh, I'm very happy about that, but uh, my picture did not come up. So uh, I'm sorry about that. You hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think my uh, intervention will be uh, very short and very basic. I, I want to uh, put some words uh, to what you already know, uh, I suppose. Uh, this is about water sharing. Uh, water is shared. Uh, I think we all know that. Uh, water is shared at the local level, at the national level, as well as at transboundary level. So uh, uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, water, the water thing, is very important uh, as a very important resource for our life, uh, not only for our physical life, for our uh, social, cultural life, economic life, we all know that. Uh, uh, but what uh, uh, people uh, might miss is that water is shared. So uh, uh, water flows from one point to, to another, it's also known. Uh, and at all points, uh, people share, communities share, and nations share. I think that is uh, very basic uh, to understand how countries are obliged to put institutions, to put agreements, to put mechanisms of sharing and using water resources to its best possible uh, potential. So uh, uh, it's also uh, important that uh, uh, water resources are connectors, uh, not dividers. Uh, but we have to discover uh, uh, the, the very positive aspect of uh, that water resources connect uh, communities and countries, but we have to find right methodology and right mechanism how to positively utilize that uh, connection. Internationally, this has been very well uh, understood and realized that uh, the UN members negotiated uh, to establish uh, an international principle for water resources which are shared. Uh, I'm talking about uh, 1997 UN Convention on Shared Water Resources. So uh, this has been signed and ratified by majority of UN members. So there, shared waters uh, should be addressed in such a way country must agree and must be very careful and considerate to utilize water resources within their territorial boundaries 
in equitable and reasonable manner. Uh, at the same time, not really causing significant harm to other countries in the basin. But this is a very important message, an international accepted principle. In fact, that developing this, the Nile Basin countries really sit down, negotiated for 11 years. They came up with an agreement known as Operative Framework Agreement. And that agreement it has been really, to much extent, drawn from international convention, uh, which was uh, uh, developed and signed by the UN members. There also the same principle of uh, sharing water resources in equitable and reasonable manner, developing it, using it, uh, and not causing sig significant harm to others. That was also a commitment by the majority of the United States countries. And in fact, uh, in, the, in the context of uh, uh, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan negotiated very intensively, and they came up with a declaration of uh, principles. There also, uh, they more or less agreed that the Nile is shared, and the, the eastern part of Nile is shared. Therefore, they address sharing of the water resources in the Eastern Nile in the context of Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam in equitable and reasonable manner. So uh, this theme of using water resources in equitable and reasonable manner, since water is shared, not causing significant harm to others, has been really something which has been more or less uh, a consensus by international community uh, at, uh, at UN level, as well as at uh, uh, the basin level. But when we come to the Nile Basin, uh, the Nile Basin lacks a really uh, institutional and regional re legal mechanism to put a real operational uh, you know, uh, commitments uh, in the sharing uh, and uh, using the water resources together cooperatively. Uh, in the absence of this institutional mechanism, countries have been utilizing uh, their uh, part of the water resources, water resources that flows in their country, passes through, through their countries uh, in unilateral manner. That's what we have observed, how the uh, highest one dam developed how uh, dams in Sudan developed, uh, all of them, you know, uh, Senar or Aulia or El or, uh, uh, you know, uh, Meroe or Rosaris. It's in the same way in Ethiopia, a lot of dams have been developed unilaterally, uh, just, you know, in, in, in a traditional manner, nine basic countries have no operation tradition and countries cannot sit idly, you know, from uh, uh, away from utilizing the water resources. That is why each country has been using it unilaterally in their best way possible. And Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam has also been developed in this manner. Uh, therefore, uh, my message would be that uh, uh, countries, whether they are in the upstream or downstream, must realize that the water resources are shared. No country can claim monopoly of uh, the uh, shared water resources, whether they are at the beginning of the flow or at the end of the flow. Uh, therefore, what they have to focus is, uh, uh, politically speaking, geopolitically speaking, uh, from the practical point of developing water resources, they must really uh, focus on enlarging the pie rather than monopolizing the pie. If countries focus on enlarging the pie, then they look for best possibilities uh, of the potential that they can develop the, the shared water resources within their own country. And also other countries do uh, the best use of uh, the water in their uh, in their own countries in such a way, development in one country can be uh, complementary to development 
in the other country that really puts the countries working into enlarging the pie rather than buying for controlling totality of the shared water resources or monopolizing of the total water resources. That being my final message, thank you for, uh, for listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yakob, uh, for joining us. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Magdalawit Masai, uh, one of WUI Aspire members, uh, to take us through the Q&A and in the final uh, segment. Uh, Magdalawit Masai Derive is a doctoral uh, student at Florida International University. Uh, her research focuses on long-term sustainable and equitable utilization of transboundary water resources with a specific interest on the Nile Basin. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Addis Ababa Institute of Technology in Ethiopia, a Master of Science in Environmental Science from Wageningen University in the Netherlands, and a Master of Science in Hydraulic Engineering from Addis Ababa Institute of Technology in Ethiopia. Magdala is actively involved in the Nile water use discussion. She has done her master's thesis on equitable and reasonable use of Nile River, uh, written several opinion piece and contributed to numerous panel discussions on topics. Uh, beside her academic engagement in the Nile Magdala, it's also involved in the social advocacy around the Nile Basin, like she's very active and we aspire, uh, working to illuminate the multiple stories and narratives across the basin and fostering dialogue with the hope of bringing people together, creating a shared understanding, empathy, and a culture of peace in the basin. With that, uh, I will pass it on to Dr. Russo to summarize uh, the previous uh, uh, topic discussed by our participants. And then we have several questions received from attendees. Uh, and I would like to thank everyone who's following this webinar. Uh, today, we have some time for a q and I'm happy that we left enough time for discussion. So with that, Dr. Torso, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Again, I would like to thank all our panelists. Excellent discussion. We are going as, as we just planned. The idea was to have, have the first hour frame setting uh, opportunities and then the, the next one hour. So we have one hour for Q&A as well as uh, any additional thoughts. Uh, I just want to mention that we, we heard a really great presentation starting uh, with Dale. Uh, I think one of the things I took from him was that some of these countries may not be wanting to negotiate. So we have to figure out why that's the case, as well as uh, some of the uh, scientific presentation will come back that uh, that may not help uh, to, in that direction, bringing you know, uh, togetherness, cooperation um, as such. Those are excellent uh, references you heard there. Uh, with Edo, I think uh, interesting thing I captured also is that we need to expand the envelope of cooperation. Uh, we have a few questions. I have prepared a few questions as well. And some of the things, how we actually get to there. Uh, we saw on in terms of uh, sharing information, sharing uh, data, sharing um, um, uh, this planning and how uh, this kind of things could be a reality. I know that... Uh, most of us are, I wouldn't consider myself, but uh, in the research, but we have to figure out how we, uh, we translate this into some actionable, uh, you know, actionable information that others could use. Then we heard from uh, Dr. Abdul Karim. Uh, I think he covered a lot of ground there, including the uh, why we don't have, I will have a question later, why we don't have actually a conjunctive water use. Uh, that includes both surface water and groundwater. Understood that some of them are non-renewable and renewable, but some of them are. Uh, you, you saw some of the challenge in terms of variability of climate that, that impacts uh, how we manage, uh, as well as the, the increased stress in the watersheds through population growth. So um, stresses like climate, uh, as well as population growth are, are huge. And as we move forward, I, I think we have to look uh, how we can work within this constraint. Uh, it is clear to me that it is better to work with a bigger boundary than uh, individual countries. Then we heard from Dr. Yakov some of the, back, the background as well as the water sharing uh, issue, and then a little bit of history as well. Uh, point well taken uh, looks to me. Uh, I think you, Dr. Yakov, also in a way uh, mentioned, stressed what Dale at the beginning said in terms of 
why these countries and which direction they are going, as well as um, what they, they selected uh, for what reason. Uh, these are excellent um, uh, presentation. Uh, like I said, we have uh, one more hour for Q&A and others. So I'm gonna start, this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna start, uh, come to the presenters, one question for everyone, and then McLeod has additional, she was uh, uh, putting together some of the uh, audience questions. So mine will be prepared by myself. Uh, so I will go first for uh, each of the panelists with one question. And let me start where I have. Um, so I will start with uh, Dale. I, you mentioned about some of the challenge uh, in terms of studies. I think you put uh, a, a couple of papers there uh, in terms of uh, things that are not helpful. And I, I really appreciate you shared the, uh, the webinar by uh, Dr. Kevin as well. Um, I'm one of the other group who are challenging actually one of the paper. Um, th but the question I want to raise is that media tends to pick this kind of papers and uh, it just blow up in terms of uh, un you know, unnecessary headlines, just create more tension. And the academic process to rebuting this kind of studies uh, takes time. Uh, for example, ours is submitted in July, still it's under the, this is not decided. Uh, so you can imagine you have these six months, eight months, uh, by the time you reach there, um, it, there is a lot of damage the media has done in terms of uh, creating an assertion. How do you see that beyond scientific rebuttals? What should we do in, in, for such kind of case of, you know, I consider really not defensible uh, studies, some of them? It's a, it's a great question. Um, and I, I don't think the scientific community uh, focuses enough on um, communicating with the public and civil society on what they agree on. I said that I think there is a growing consensus on among the hydrologists and engineers about um, the effects of the GERD and, and the, the real issues. And I linked, uh, you know, I sent the link to Kevin Wheeler's um, presentation, which I, I think, you know, that's an example of um, one way of dealing with, you know, this social media attention is, is scholars like uh, Dr. Wheeler, you know, trying to um, rebut, you know, bad analysis. I mean, uh, in real time, I mean, getting, getting things out on YouTube and forth. I, I don't think the academic, the scholarly community has done enough on this, uh, you know, so I, I take your point. It's a, it's a really um, conundrum. It, at this point, I don't think we we were quite prepared as a scientific community, either the um, the technical side or the economist, you know, the policymakers, really to try to um, deal with this social media phenomenon that we're we're really seeing. It's a it's a new problem for us. I mean, you know, many times academics want to be heard, and they aren't heard. But in this this age of social media, sometimes they get heard too quickly, and. You know, so I, I don't have any I don't have any good answers for you, but I think you put your finger on a really important problem in the in the basin and globally, where we where we, we have an extra responsibility in in the scholarly community to um, ensure the quality of what we're what's published in the journals and what we're what we're saying. Thank you. Uh, the next one goes to uh, Dr. Edo. Um, it's a two part uh, question I have for you. Uh, you show given a cooperative scenarios or historical simulation, I believe that you showed what happened long term in terms of the water energy food nexus, optimized cooperation. Uh, but at the countries develop and their need change, uh, perhaps there may be, there may not be a lot of incentive for them to cooperate. Uh, I mean, looking ahead 20, 30 years, what could happen? That's how do you see we uh, figure this problem? And uh, related to that, uh, you also showed that this uh, water energy food nexus cooperation brings additional benefit to everyone. But in the future, there may be a lot of different new water energy food infrastructure upstream and perhaps more competition for water in the upstream countries. Um, would there be even a space uh, for managing, cooperatively managing um, uh, resources as you show? Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, really nice question. Um... So I think they are connected. Okay, long term, would there be uh, space for cooperation? I think my answer would be yes. 
Um, in, in fact, uh, I was listening to uh, uh, Abdul Karim's um, uh, points about conjunctive water use and that we haven't uh, utilized it. And I think if you look downstream, uh, we know that in Egypt, for example, there are huge um, resources, you know, that, that could go for 100 years, but they're very deep and you need energy for those. Huh? And, 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 and so if, if I think long term, um, as uh, technical people, we can actually analyze all these possibilities. I, as I showed in my first slide, we can consider all these scenarios globally, what do the market? What would the markets look like in future? And 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 and, and I think uh, Abdul Karim also showed that um, uh, the, the the kind of the population grows and the needs that that are going to develop in these countries. So we can actually model these, and we can say, okay, what kind of infrastructure do we need? So in that sense, if we explore in, in the whole basin, what is the most cost optimal way to 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 to, to, to kind of uh, meet those demands. And then we, we know how to also model technologies. Huh? So I, I should, uh, we have learning curves for different technologies now. Huh? We, we have renewable technologies uh, and, and how they would develop, et cetera, their, their cost and so on. We can simulate all these things. So in principle, we, we can look at that space and that's, that's the kind of work that I'm doing. And, and, and I'm very much convinced that there would always be uh, a, a bigger pie, so to say, uh, or a bigger envelope for cooperation than if you were to uh, to to just do things unilaterally. Uh, uh, maybe an, an, another thing to kind of worry about, uh, and my message would be also: uh, you you have, if you plan infrastructure unilaterally, uh, then you may have lock in uh, uh, kind of capital in, in in some infrastructure that is not really conducive to cooperation. So I think that's what you are implying in your question, perhaps. So th that would be something to avoid, I would say. So, so what are sort of, if you think long-term 2060 uh, and, and, and we, we have a pathway towards kind of meeting certain demands, what are the kind of infrastructures that would not lock in you know, capital and, and, and are, are not gonna be you know, cost-effective, et cetera? We could do these kinds of analysis. Uh, and, and I think if, if I look at um, the EU where I live, um, you know, I, I now we, we I work within the energy sector and, and there is market integration even in the grid. You know, that's the kind of stuff we model. So the, the, the energy, the electricity markets are being integrated and each country is kind of planning a renewable integration. But but it's, it's also in, in line with, you know, global drivers like, you know, uh, climate change mitigation targets. You know, now we have the Green Deal in the EU and in the US as well, similar uh, kind of equivalent um, targets are being set. So I, I think if we kind of track these targets and, and look at what are the most cost optimal way that, 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 that will meet the, the demand and in an excess uh, context where we could actually really uh, optimize efficiencies of all resource use, land, water, and, and, and ener renew renewable energy resources, then, then we will have these answers. Uh, so I, I have no doubts that uh, that this won't be an issue in future. Thank you, uh, Dr. Edo. The next one, since you called, uh, you, you referenced Dr. Abdul Karim in terms of conjective water use, that was actually where I was going. Um, Dr. Abdul Karim, you showed the, uh, not only surface water, but groundwater resources. Some of them, yes, true, they are not renewable, but there are also shallow where, shallow groundwater that can be used in a conjunctive way to at least uh, um, to at least use it during a drought, whether we have a, whether the drought, as I as I would say, uh, but we haven't seen that. Uh, so how what would it take for us to you know within the Nile Basin that people would actually use in a way that is combined? Uh, I can give example what we do here. Um, you know, in drought time, you get to the shallow well and so on, and then when you have more surplus uh, time. You go to the surface water, you may store it uh, or also uh, put your in, in the ground uh, as well. Uh, how do you how do you see this playing out? And that's my question, the first question. And related to that, most of the time with the food energy nexus and later on, Edo, you can come back to this as well. There is an embedded water sharing issue as well. Uh, how do you how do you see solving that underlying issue uh, of water sharing, whether we 
whether we it's bundled in in, in energy or or uh, or other uh, how, how do you see that as well so if you could uh, please elaborate on those two thanks you are you are muted okay yeah, thanks. No, yeah. I, I was expecting that you'd ask me that question <laughs> yeah <clears throat> good when it comes to conjective use I think it's a question of scale. So uh, what, why I'm saying that is that's already happening. Uh, if you see, you know, when I was in NBI, we were also like studying uh, countries' documents as well. And some level of groundwater use, even for irrigation, is in practice in, in many countries. Although in, in most upstream countries, groundwater is being used for domestic purposes, but increasingly, you know, using it for small scale irrigation is also happening now. It's a question of scale we are talking about. So, uh, just this is one on the fact. Uh, just to to mention, um, the UMI has developed, for example, solar irrigation suitability map for Ethiopia, where you know, largely solar using solar irrigation pumps from shallow groundwater. So there is already increasing recognition by many of the countries to use water in a conjunctive manner. Um, just a few days ago, I think, yeah, from Tuesday to Wednesday, there was uh, a conference of the IGAD region. Uh, many of the IGAD, you know, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, countries also are, are also members of NBI, a specific conference on groundwater. So this groundwater conjunctive use has all been emphasized very much. So it's a question of scale, really, and countries are coming to it, in my view. Um, but, but you know, it requires quite a lot of uh, investment because there's a huge gap in the knowledge on groundwater resource distribution. That is one important factor. And the, the other one is the pumping costs as well. If you are talking about groundwater, then energy, energy resource it becomes very important, especially in rural areas. Uh, now, you know, solar irrigation is being promoted, but again, it has also its own pluses and minuses, uh, especially the huge initial investment cost. I mean, huge means relatively to the economies of the, you know, the communities in rural uh, countries like Ethiopia or other, you know, upstream uh, in countries. So in my view, this is already starting, it's happening, but it's not to the level you would really want it or you see it in elsewhere in, in the developed world. And I think, Countries are moving in that direction, in my view. There's a huge, huge call for that. Now, when it comes to water sharing, yes. uh, the point you mentioned, um, well, I was thinking really how to respond to that question, but um, look, if you see the, the cooperative framework agreement, what the, the Professor Jacob mentioned, um, to the extent I understand, it really focused on river water on the blue, on the river flow, in the river water, in the river system. I, I think there was a purpose in my view why countries focused on that. And don't forget this negotiation on CFA started in 1997. Um, so, you know, at that time, maybe th there wasn't much knowledge or there are many other reasons why countries really focus on that. But what I really would like to say is the groundwater resource or the rainfall, they don't have to be on the table for sharing. I mean, that's not the only way of using them in my view. So if a country, for example, taps on its groundwater resources and makes better use of rainfall, even if it's not discussed in the water sharing negotiations, it is contributing at the country level to, you know, to, for increasing the food production or energy production, depending upon the case. And that indirectly is really contributing to transboundary cooperation because, because you know, transboundary water management for several reasons, countries really focus on the river system. It's very difficult to change that in my view. Given the current situation in the Nile, I'm not very optimistic. Countries would like to you know, bring all the resources you know, on the table. Although I know when they, when they talk about, when the CFA talks about equitable and reasonable utilization, one of the factors they consider that will be considered is available, availability of alternative resources or water sources like rainfall or groundwater and so on. But that, that is an indirect contribution. So, Really, my view is the more countries also utilize 
make best use of rainfall and the groundwater, it will, the more it will ease the pressure on the river system, which also indirectly contributes to the, the negotiation on the river, around, around the river system itself. That's how I look at it. And I don't expect countries will really talk about how to share rainfall and how to, how to share the groundwater as well. The other thing which I'd like to highlight is really, you know, if you go to upstream countries of the Nile, most of the population depends on rainfall agriculture. It, it is, I don't think it is likely that this will be automatically converted to irrigation. Or, I mean, it will take a lot of time. And I don't think it will, it will I mean, in my view, for the coming few decades, still rainfall agriculture becomes is become very important, still remains very important sector. So enhancing the effectiveness of using rainfall in the rainfall system is very important. And then I think that will also contribute indirectly to the transboundary cooperation on the Nile itself. So to summarize, I don't expect the water sharing discussion between the countries will include groundwater rainfall, although except the as a factor in equitable in, in revitalization. But the more countries tap also into groundwater and rain, rainfall more effectively and in a conjunctive manner, it will indirectly contribute to either pressure on the river system, which in a way will contribute to the transboundary cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um... The next one is uh, for uh, Professor Yakov. Um, I think we heard some of the background, uh, including the, uh, some of the agreement 2015. Uh, if I use one of your <coughs> sentence and then tie it back to what Dale said, it looks to me that there is quite a bit of challenge for these three countries uh, to get to reasonable uh, negotiation and, and going forward as well. So water sharing still is there, that issue is there. Um, what must happen now going forward? Because it is clear to me that, uh, uh, and, and it was demonstrated through this water energy food nexus. There are so many other studies. They say that uh, you get the best out of it if you cooperate. Uh, to what level, how these countries are uh, wanting to do that is a question. But how do you see that we, are get, we need to get there? Uh, that, I think that's issue. I don't think it's a matter of, us not knowing what's going to happen and how cooperation help us. Uh, but it seems that everybody wants their own interest and so on. So how can we break that? And, and given your experience on, on the negotiation and others, how do you see must happen uh, to bring everybody that's acceptable to all of them? Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, really a big question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, countries, uh, especially those uh, uh, who are in, in, in political will, uh, should think about this. And uh, the experience of uh, negotiation uh, through uh, years, the first round of negotiation, uh, like uh, my colleague Abdul Karim uh, mentioned, the CFA, it took a lot of time. Uh, the whole question uh, boils down uh, how to make best use of uh, the shared water resources. So uh, the issue of shared water resources is not really debatable. Uh, every country shares a portion of, of the uh, of the nine. Uh, but the best thing is uh, that the countries uh, did not go into and did not want uh, really to take the example of uh, controlling any amount or any portion of the water resources. Majority of uh, the negotiating uh, repairs really agreed uh, after long uh, negotiation that uh, uh, the whole point is uh, to establish cooperation and to establish mechanism for cooperation. And through that mechanism, countries can put their uh, plans, their wishes, the best possibilities of developing water resources in their countries without really putting the other countries into jeopardy. So that was the whole idea there will not be any physical sharing of the water resources. This cannot be accepted. That's why uh, I was 
actually uh, sharing the view, my view, that uh, no country, by the virtue of being the source, or by the fact of being the mouth of a, a river, in this case Nile, can control or should control the water resources, or take any portion, uh, bigger or smaller, for itself alone. So the question is, sharing is how to make the possibility of developing these water resources uh, with the best potential in each country. So the uh, operation goes to sharing the benefits, sharing the uh, uh, you know the results of uh, putting the development in each country, the shared waters, into best uh, you know fruits. So I think this is the whole idea. In the future, I think countries can and should realize that unilateral approach to water development in each country is not sustainable. It creates more complications. That is why they have to establish mechanisms. They have to establish legal and institutional frameworks for this in order to expect who can have the best uh, you know, possibilities of utilizing in which best water use sector, hydropower or food production or you know, other things are of this potential. So in the future, I think uh, this is a question the countries must really realize and should realize that this is shared resource over which uh, you call, they can exercise their you know, best wishes and enlarge the possibilities of cooperation and benefiting from each other's creativity and you know, uh, economic planning uh, in which they can also participate you know, at one or another level. So the future is, uh, I think, uh, quite challenging, but the task is quite clear. There is no way that no country can monopolize or claim monopoly, whether there is an agreement of such a nature or not, it doesn't matter. So I think that is what uh, I, I, would, I, I would think. Uh, thank you. Thank you, and uh, we are going to pass uh, to Magdalawit uh, for um, asking some of the audience because these are all my prepared questions. But before I pass that, I have a few things that I want you to think. Um, and when I come back later on, based on time, uh, Abdul Karim, I think we, I agree with you in terms of rainfall that, uh, you know, especially rainfall translated into river flow, the whole thing, some of them, you know, a lot of it is ET that goes out. But uh, in terms of groundwater, how do you think? Because even the 97 uh, agreement, most of the time uh, cited the water course. So it, it includes groundwater and surface water. So how do you see that playing in terms of the uh, getting into this negotiation? Um, you don't have to answer now. And then for Dale, I think I remember in one of earlier in one of some time ago, your presentation, uh, which I like, you said that uh, when you, um, mention about what happened in Washington, he said, you said that these three countries actually missed the opportunity to just agree on the first fling and hey, cheers, and then build, uh, build partnership and build confidence and they can go and tackle uh, the next very difficult one is comprehensive water sharing. So I want you to reflect on that and, and to explain us when we come back. Um, for Edo, uh, the water sharing issue, I would like you to answer as well within the water food nexus. Uh, and then now I'm going to pass it to Magdalite um, so that we address, um, as we promised, the audience question as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. This is turning out to be a very lively presentation. Lots of important issues from different aspects are being raised, which always makes for a, a full understanding of the issue. I'll first start with uh, questions for, for Dr. Dale Whittington. There's a question in the chat that says, why are all the modeling studies being done with the assumption or expectation of allowing Egypt to get or release 55.5 billion cubic meters, which is obviously pointing to the 1959 agreement? Even the drought managements are designed 
So that's the hatch, the S1 high dam does not go below critical levels, which is based on the assumption that the hatch gets 55.5 BCM. As modelers, we understand that you need a baseline to model harm or damage, but this is an obvious issue for Ethiopia and the other countries as well. What would you say to people who are skeptical of the implications of these studies for water allocation? Um, it's a great uh, question, um, and I think um, it's really unfortunate that uh, this baseline issue didn't get um, sorted out uh, with the consultant study six years ago. I mean, it would have been much more productive, I think, you know, looking back, I, uh, I don't think we realized what a, uh, what a lost opportunity that was. I mean, the studies could have been done with alternative baselines. I, this is not something that is so common in the, the, the water resources uh, field, but other professions are much more tuned into uh, this idea that we need to look at different um, dynamic baselines. So there was a disagreement between Egypt and Ethiopia on the, on the baseline issue. And the consultant studies could have been done if you think of it as a sensitivity analysis, they could have been done with Egypt's baseline and they could have been done with Ethiopia's baseline and they could have been done with Sudan's baseline. And I think that would have been, in the retrospect, a very um, useful thing to, to do. Um, unfortunately, it was never, it was never done. The, the consultant studies never um, uh, got going. But I, I would say, you know, to, <laughs> That should be something under consideration to go back and you know try to get a scientific consensus on um, the importance of the baseline and understanding the economic impacts of the GERD. I think it's a great question, um, and I don't. Um, I, yeah, I I, I think um, the analysis could have been done with alternative dynamic baselines, and and that might have been a very um, I'll say productive dialogue between the countries. Another question for you is, uh, given the evident benefit of the dam, why rehash information claiming economic damages to Egypt? I will let you respond to that and then we can move on to the other speakers. Um, could you repeat the question? I'm not quite sure I understood it. It says, given the evident benefits of the dam, I'm guessing to downstream countries, why rehash information claiming economic damages to Egypt? Um, well, there's there's two parts of that. Um, I was showing those two papers that uh, were claiming that there were huge damages to Egypt is something that I considered incorrect. So I, I wasn't, I was, re, if you call it rehashing, I was, really trying to emphasize the role of uh, misinformation in the uh, current controversy. So I, I was disputing those two papers. I, I wasn't rehashing it. On the other hand, I think it's important to realize that um, uh, Egypt does have a real uh, risk. It's a small probability risk, um, but if a multi-year drought occurs during the filling of the GERD, um, this is going to be a problem. And I think there's no, um, I think, uh, the technical community understands this uh, quite well. And um, what I said was that I think that's a, that's a role for the international community to uh, help ensure Egypt against the damages from that unlikely but very real scenario. I don't think there's any, um, um, nothing to be gained here by denying that uh, uh, Egypt could be hurt in a multi-year drought during the filling of the GERD. I mean, they, they would be. And I think it's, you know, if this was one country, I mean, it's not, but if it were one country, the upstream riparians would certainly uh, be concerned about the damages that would occur uh, downstream under that set of conditions. Thank you, Dr. Withington. Okay, moving on to questions for Dr. Edo. There's a question in the chat that says, it is good to cooperate on infrastructure development to have more benefits. However, there are significant unilateral infrastructures that cause uh, that 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 critically spoil the cooperation in the region and also hinder uh, and their legacy also hinders the current as well as future cooperation. How do 
how, how does the regional cooperation become free from the legacy of these unilateral infrastructures? It's a very difficult question, but yeah. I, I think Professor Whittington kind of now partially answered it. Um, so we're talking about, even when we're talking about the HAD is the, the Aswan Dam, we're talking about stranded assets in a way, yeah? If we say um, we have now a, a new water sharing agreement, and let's say Ethiopia has 37%, and then uh, if you have multi-year uh, droughts and then suddenly the HAD is no longer kind of satisfying its intended use. So that is a problem for Egypt. So I think that is, a, that is something that has to be settled uh, both uh, long term. For example, Egypt could, in, in our work, for example, we see uh, kind of when you optimize cropping patterns, uh, yeah, the, 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 the kind of the social planner says that we should go away from unproductive agricultural uh, practices. So that means some livelihoods would be lost. That, of course, that is an economic problem. That is a social planning problem. Huh? It's not a... Uh, so then that's also a political problem now it becomes. So that, that is quite complicated. But this is something that has to be faced, yeah? and then, and we, we have to quantify this: who 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 be, who benefits, who loses, who pays for it, and the political implications, of course, nationally have to be dealt with. So, um, yes, it, it is a problem. But then we, we could also, uh, yeah, these baseline, baselines, whatever you may call them, we, we could take these into account and we say, okay, what is the kind of the most effective new infrastructure and how, do, how would we avoid these, these stranding of assets or, you know, uh, uh, livelihoods being lost in future. So this is something that has to be done cooperatively. And, 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 and uh, yeah. It's not a technical problem. Huh? It's not a, just a mathematical problem because we can plan. Huh? We can find alternatives that say, okay, what is the least um, uh, harmful for everyone and, and who pays for that? Is it the international community? Is, you know, uh, there are some distributional questions, uh, fairness questions that should be asked. Yeah. Um, but fundamentally, I mean, the water sharing question comes back because you could say, you know, multi drought years. Ethiopia could sell the water, and then what's the value of that water? You know, and there, are, this is a big question. So, we we don't really have kind of the infrastructure there, uh, the institutional infrastructure for doing this. I I don't know how the NBI has not been effective, perhaps in in achieving this over twenty years. Perhaps it has tried. You know, it's just uh, but others could comment on this. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Ido. Another question for you was, uh, what kind of water cooperation model can, can these countries search for? Or do you think there are any theoretical systems that they can learn from? I'm guessing they were referring to your Nexus model. Oh, okay. Uh, is, is this, um, so models, I, I think there are multiple models uh, developed by uh, lots of uh, technical groups, I, I think. Um, uh, the Manchester University group was mentioned, I think, some of the slides of uh, Professor Whittington at TU Delft in, in the Netherlands. We have quite a few models. Um, there are international integrated assessment models that are global, that, that, that can be scaled down to, to do this kind of assessment uh, at, at, you know, country level or in, 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 a, in a regional level. Uh, I think the NBI itself has uh, decision support systems, which, which we, my, some of my students have studied. Um, how effectively it is being used by, by, by countries, the, this decision support system from the NBI, for example, I, I don't know, perhaps uh, Abdul Karim can, can comment on, on this. But I don't think technical tools are the limitation. Um, uh, and then the question, if it's alluding to a kind of real examples of cooperation and, and in a transboundary uh, basin, I think we have multiple uh, good examples in the US, of course, we have the Colorado uh, River Basin, uh, you know, uh, the uh, in Europe as well here, uh, we have some 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 uh, some river basins where there's uh, amazing levels of cooperation, even in, in even in environmental protection, you know, uh, going past the, the kind of the economic questions of, of using the, the river infrastructure. So uh, yeah, there, there are working examples. Uh, yeah, but that's, I, I would say beyond the scope of my um, my, 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 my expertise, but, but yeah. Yeah, 
Fair enough. Uh, the next set of questions is for Dr. Abdul Karim. There was one question regarding aquifers. It says, given the occasional massive floods, floods, has anyone studied the feasibility of using aquifers as a source for water conservation? Uh, the, uh, the, the reader says, I recently saw a program about Libyan investment to, to access groundwater. Considering we can access groundwater, why not design the access to include storage during flooding times? Thank you. Thank you. Um, excellent question. Um, yes, th there has been or there are already attempts um, to use floods actually uh, for recharging groundwater aquifers. And uh, I'm personally was not involved in those studies, but in, in the conference I was uh, participating a few days ago, quite a few papers were presented actually on case studies. Uh, partly what they call managed aquifer recharge, and but also like using you know fl like flood water to recharge aquifers. Um, I can I can link the the person who asked this question to some of the experts at UMI as well, who could give him or her more information about where this has been practiced. Uh, what I can say generally is this is still very at very early stage, but this practice is already there. Okay. Flares are being used to recharge aquifers. That's a very good question. Yes. Okay. I think it would uh, be. If, I, if, can, if I can have the address of the person, then I can link him with experts on this. Wonderful. Okay. So uh, let me let me add one more question to you because it came uh, from our audience and this Abdul Karim. Uh, this is the question of drought. Uh, the question was that shouldn't all the country be sharing drought? I believe what they want to get at is that. Um, climate change, for example, change things, uh, you know, it could be variabilities, but the drought, we know that the drought uh, comes at some point. And uh, some of the study shows that if it, there is a multiple drought, that's where there could be an issue to Egypt high, high as one dam as well. I can speak my experience on how the Colorado River Basin does here. In fact, for the first time in their history, January 1st, 2022, they instituted the first cut of their share uh, from three of the state. So again, I guess the question is, why is not possible for everyone to share drought? Yeah, if, yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think I saw it also, I think, on the chat. Um, if you ask my, question, my opinion, yes. Uh, you don't only share rewards, but also you share the risk, obviously. So I, I personally believe the, the countries need to share also the impacts of the drought. So it's not only on one country to, uh, to be the burden of the, the drought. But, I mean, I don't have any, any doubt on that. The question is now how to do it. You see, if you think of a hypothetical situation where we don't have these borders between countries, let's say it's just one country, the entire Nile Basin, then obviously, you know, you optimize uh, the use of water in drought conditions and in normal conditions or in you know, times of water abundance, obviously. And there are many, many solutions for that. There are many tools for that. The imperfection comes when you have the borders and many other factors come to, into play. So otherwise, as a matter of principle, I think that is where we, the countries should be heading, in my view, uh, sharing the rewards, and also, but sharing also the risks. Yeah, obviously. But NBI was, I mean, just to give um, a little bit of um, more supplement to, I think what Dr. Edo was saying uh, about this uh, unilateralism as well. I mean, we need to be really realistic here. I don't expect re unilateral development of projects will cease, you know, um, I mean, the coming years, a few years by time, because we are far away from it. So we, we need to be, like thinking of how best you know countries can cooperate given that some of the projects are really unilateral there are many reasons why countries go unilateral i have also tried to highlight some of them um, you, you see normally like big projects like dam projects they normally take a lot of time we know from the time of inception up to the realization of a dam project makes take two decades three decades and add to it you know this process of multi-country cooperation again that will take a lot more time. So, but the, the need doesn't give you so much time. The pressure on governments doesn't give you so much time. 
So that's where one of the challenges. And I always ask myself, you know, if I were in a downstream country position, I want countries upstream to really, you know, be readily cooperate on their projects. I just ask, why don't they ask? Of, we, I should ask myself also, what kind of incentive can I give upstream countries so that they can discuss their projects with me? Because it is of mutual interest that they share the information. Mm -hmm. they, they collaboratively plan because they can not only minimize impact, but also they can also maximize benefits to all of them. So, but unfortunately that kind of process, I don't see it happening. So that's where the really challenge is. And I, I share the views of Dr. Edo on that. So, but I, I'm really realistic on that. I don't expect unilateralism to end anytime soon, but we can still help countries, especially through tools and new information, for example, make better decisions given the imperfect, actually, transboundary cooperation. I see Dr. Yakov raised his hand. Uh, Dr. Yakov? Yeah, go ahead. You admit. So I'm just moving my, uh, my, my ballpoint point by taking notes, <laughs> not raising hand. Thank you. <laughs> Well, the next set of questions is actually for you, so uh, <laughs> okay. that's like time. <laughs> you, okay. you can stay there. Okay. <laughs> okay, so there's one question in the chat that says, Ethiopia's distributed energy source composes of 90% from hydropower. How does Ethiopia plan to address this issue moving forward to optimize the energy sources by diversification? Uh, Maybe others can yeah. chime in as well. Um. Yeah, I think that 90% uh, hydro uh, power source is, uh, you know, what, what actually is. But the government policy, as far as I, I followed, I read, is to diversify, uh, uh, you know, the energy sources. Uh, with uh, you know uh, wind power, uh, uh, geothermal, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know uh, other small small energy sources like biogas is not significant. But I think the government has been planning, and it is also in the recent policy document that diversification is uh, the uh, not only the intention but the commitment uh, of uh, the government. I think this uh, uh, will, will change. Uh, I, I think Ethiopia has a lot of potential. Everybody knows, uh, uh, you know, hydropower. Uh, I think that is the best option uh, uh, to be uh, the highest proportion of uh, energy uh, source in Ethiopia. Uh, I think that is uh, what has demonstrated but this is going to diversify. I think government is committed as far as I read the process. Thank you. The second question is in regard to the negotiation process. It says, in your opinion, how does the upcoming negotiation evolve after Egypt and Sudan place the Nile, uh, the Nile Guardian joint military front close to the border? Does Ethiopia ask first if this is a threat to be moved away from this border? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, there are reports that uh, Sudan and Egypt uh, has been moving, uh, uh, claiming uh, and showing some cooperation for a potential uh, protection of their water or whatever interest. Uh, I think the negotiation has started, uh, you know, long time ago. Uh, it is more of a dialogue. And this dialogue is continuing now. It has been continued, I think, under the facilitation of, uh, of the unity. Uh, now a third uh, uh, chairman is going to take uh, the office next month. Uh, then the dialogue would continue as long as Egypt and Sudan are willing to come, not uh, uh, you know, boycotting some of the uh, sessions. I think this is in the best interest of Sudan, Ethiopia, and Egypt to continue dialoguing. If there is any possibility of agreeing on some points where compromises as possible, 
I think that is the best option that we're looking for. But otherwise, uh, I mean, military threats and so do not change the course of the water and do not really change that Egypt is a downstream country. Or that does not change that Egypt is an upstream country. And that does, that does not repre replace uh, the, the uh, I mean, not only the possibility, but also the obligation of facing countries to negotiate over the utilization of the shared water resources. I mean, I don't think this is really a big issue. I think they should not obstruct negotiation. And Egypt and Sudan cannot, we should not use this as a, you know, a mechanism of threat. Uh, put forward what they want to be uh, happen in their own terms. So I think their option is not something I, I personally share. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, sir. Just, just um, um, before we got so many great questions from the audience as well, I want to go back to the one of the question I raised earlier. So I will go to Dale. Uh, I mentioned what you said uh, in one of your presentation regarding they would have been uh, better off if they just agreed the first feeling and, and considered that as an accomplishment and then tackle the the more challenging comprehensive uh, water allocation and all those issues. So could you elaborate and how do you see things going now and how do you see it should go? And what can we do that, you know, to get to what you just said on one of your conference I heard? Well, um, thanks for the question. Um, you know, this is a very complicated negotiations. I, I'm, I'm really not trying to offer too much advice for the negotiating parties. But I, I do think if you if you think about Abdul Karim's um, uh, call for cooperation and Ito's call for cooperation, um, it's very hard to get there without a, some kind of agreement on the GERD, right? right? I mean, it, we all kind of know where we'd like to in, end up. We'd like the parties to end up um, you know, thinking beyond um, the river, beyond the guard, um, with you know, economic cooperation running in all kinds of directions. But it it does seem to me that um, the first step in in trust building here would reach an agreement on the guard. And my sense is that the, the filling issue is not that complicated from a technical point of view. I I understand the water sharing is very complicated, but you know, perhaps there could be a um, an ag agreement to keep talking and to, you know, uh, deal with this, you know, uh, small but real risk of, to Egypt of uh, damages occurring during uh, filling if there was a prolonged drought occurred at the same time. I mean, I think, you know, and if you can get through that pretty small probability, I think, you know, there, there's a pretty easy deal to be had why not go ahead and do that? You know, that was my my argument. Um, uh, so I, I I still think that makes some sense, but there may be other confidence building measures. Kevin uh, Wheeler had a series of confidence building measures that he mentioned in his talk yesterday um, that all made sense uh, to me. But I, I think um, in order to get to the kind of cooperation that Ido and Abdul Karim are talking about, you know, it's hard to see how you get there without without an agreement on the guard, at least in my in my view. Yeah. Um, again, like I said, we are getting a lot of questions. I, uh, we will wrap up this at twelve sharp, and then before that, so I have a, a one question that can be addressed by Dr. Abdul Abdul Karim and Edo. Uh, I just want to get there. Uh, both of you said I'm actually a little bit. <laughs> uh, how can I say? The, the Abdul Karim, I think from the practitioner perspective, what you said, it makes a lot of sense to me. And it not, I would not call it discouraging, but I think you you nailed, uh, you hit the nail on the head in terms of what's the reality. Uh, as a practitioner, I, I agree on, on you as well. But this is for both of you. So, for example, Edo, you outlined in terms of this idea of planning for new infrastructure, dams, irrigation, and variable renewal energy project. 
uh, should we plan in cooperation within the framework of water, energy, and food nexus? However, I'm not sure that even this is happening within the individual countries as well. Um, it looks to me that energy infrastructure or others are being done in silos within every country. Um, that's probably not the most economically beneficial based on, I can see from your research. How do you envision that we break this you know, it's only me and then go forward. So I, for you as well as uh, Abdul Karim, that if you could elaborate on this. Abdul Karim, please go ahead first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I will. Um, look, uh, 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 thank you very much. Um, I'll give you one example, what NBI is doing right now. Um, it started quite a few years back. Especially the, like the NBI did what they call strategic water resource analysis, which means um, they NBI try to project, pull all the planning from planning documents, all the infrastructure projects, which are planned by the countries up to 2050 or so time horizon. And they put it in, the, in their modeling framework and they projected the water demands and and try to show to the countries really if the countries go business as usual which means largely uncoordinated development the countries are going to face uh, very soon huge water deficit this was presented to the council of ministers and there's a technical working group representing the countries and and they they came up with several options to explore so the idea there really is um, through technical work to show to the countries a better, maybe a more sustainable way of accommodating the developments upstream or realizing those developments upstream in a manner that will also, you know, don't be so like disruptive to, you know, water availability elsewhere. So it's trying to find a balance that's going on still. And that was now is, moving into what they call a basin-wide investment program. The question of nexus comes here. So bringing together the energy sector, the agriculture, and then not only NBI, trying to put bring uh, on board other actors in the region, because there are also other actors in the region, like the East African Power Pool, uh, the Lake Victoria Basin Commission, IGAD, for example, the COMESA. It's not easy, but they, they are trying. They are trying to bring everybody on board, to have a fairly comprehensive investment program that will try to see different scenarios uh, of development because the development needs of upstream countries is real. So it's not something like, it's not like a luxury. So at the same time, they want to uh, like to also, you know, see into, I mean, take into account the, like the apprehension of the downstream countries as well and you know the, bring this together through different ways of scenario planning they are trying to help member countries to figure out how best to move ahead together in terms of infrastructure development planning this is being tried right away now so this is one way of doing it because really if you need cooperation institutions are important all right and if you need cooperation at the same time the tools and information is also important the country need to talk to each other as well so what I'm trying to say is it's not easy, but this is happening, but it is happening very gradually. And that's probably in the nature of things in transboundary cooperation. So, I mean, the hope I have uh, is that that will get a breakthrough uh, so that you know, member countries will, will move ahead together. But I believe in incremental you know, development, not really this comprehensive development, putting everything together in a master plan, that's not going to work. But because if, if you see the development plans in the countries, there's a huge plan for expanding irrigation, new dams, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. So if the country sees the next 10 years, then what can they work together in the next 10 years, for example? So that incremental planning could help countries also find a way of solving problems together. You know, that, I think that is very important for the process because in transboundary cooperation, process very important is very important in my view. So again, on the on the groundwater sharing, uh, groundwater and 
uh, uh, sorry, groundwater being uh, constant, water, water sharing dis discussions. Yeah. Um, I see it a very gradual process and more of indirect, yes, increasing use of groundwater by member countries, and that will indirectly contribute to it. But on the table, sharing also groundwater, I'll really be, uh, it will be a positive surprise to me actually to see it uh, happening very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we, we will be wrapping up. So Edo, if you could add in a minute uh, or, or yeah. a minute and a half, I, I uh, adding sure. this. Yes. yes. Um, uh, I think Abdul Karim really nicely uh, showed it. And I'm also very positive. I'm not pessimistic about the silos going away because uh, I think a, a lot of investment now happening. You, you mentioned the power pools. Uh, they're really planning regionally because they, they want to have uh, in, uh, the investment to really uh, um, pay back. Um, and, and so these deficits you see uh, are really driving uh, uh, people to rethink institutions. You know, I mean, in Ethiopia, we had a ministry of, you know, of the nexus even. Uh, I'm not sure how that's going to work mm -hmm. now of, uh, you know, water, uh, energy, and irrigation. I think those things also help, uh, you know, having uh, all, all the planners in, in one roof. Um, and I think the developmental agencies as well are now, you know, the, the main uh, cheerleaders of uh, kind of integrated planning uh, long term. So I am positive. I'm not. Uh, yeah. Although there is still some 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 planning happening in silos. I, I, I think even large irrigation plantations, you know, uh, and, uh, that I've, I've worked with or talked to, even those are, you know, thinking about their own energy security, really uh, thinking about what it costs them long term, medium term. So I see this integration to continue. And, and then like Abdul Karim said, a lot of the infrastructure is also not happening overnight. So I think this development would mature by by then by, by and, and would help. So, yeah. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. And before I pass to Samson for a closing remark, I really want to say thank you. Thank you so much in spending your Saturdays and busy schedule. Uh, I understand that. And you gave us excellent presentation. I just want uh, to remind folks, this is one of the four uh, webinars. We call it town hall because we wanted to give a lot of uh, interaction for uh, audience. And as you realize today, we gave one full hour for q and that really gives additional information for everyone. And again, I would thank my colleague here, Michael Lawit, also collecting all the, the some of the question and helping me as well. And with that, I will pass it to Samson. Thank you, Dr. Turuso. I would like to echo what Turuso just said. Thank you for your time. Uh, as Turuso said, this is one of the four webinars that we're planning. In the past, we had speakers from Uganda, Sudan, we want to expand this to all, you know, Africans in Nile Basin countries, and we want to have a dialogue, a peaceful dialogue. We welcome speakers from Egypt, you know, uh, to come here and uh, present opposing viewpoints and have a civil discourse and, uh, you know, a dialogue. So we aspire is very happy to be able to host this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, before I close, uh, uh, as you all know, uh, you know, Ethiopia and Sudan are really going through a tough time with internal conflicts. Um, our, you know, as on behalf of We Aspire, our collective hearts are heavy with sympathy. And uh, we, uh, you know, uh, extend our most heartfelt condolences to all the victims and also all sides and and we pray that you know peace will see uh, a chance uh, you know without peace we we can't do anything so we, we we really pray for that and i thank you uh for your time those in ethiopia dinner is ready those of you on this part of the atlantic lunch might be ready so thank you uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.